Uh, good morning. Uh, it's uh, six thirty a.m. in uh, Vancouver and LA. It's uh, nine thirty a.m. in New York. Uh, good morning to our colleagues in the U.S. and Canada. It's two thirty p.m. in London, three thirty in Europe. Good afternoon to our friends in Europe. It's seven p.m. in India, nine thirty p.m. in Singapore. A good evening, and to our friends in Australia. It's really late. Seven thirty p.m. Uh, may I request everyone to please be on mute? Everyone to please be on mute. Uh, it's um, 11.30 p.m., so well past time for our colleagues in uh, Australia. Um, a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Namaste uh, for uh, those of you who are joining for the first time. The Global Indian Physicians COVID-19 Collaborative was established on 11th of April with the support of uh, Dr. Suresh Reddy, President of RP, Dr. Ramesh Mehta, President of GAPIO, uh, Sunil Patel from KAPI, Dr. Harunberg from SINS, uh, from Anju in uh, Australia and colleagues across the globe. Uh, we had a lot of support. Hello? From Could everyone please Thanks be on the Yeah. We can, Dr. Sudhir. Um, and so um, we've grown and the idea really was to get onto this platform, one million physicians of Indian origin who practice across the globe, 400,000 outside India. We now have in, uh, Australia in 45 countries. Uh, it is a day 159 since the first COVID case was uh, detected and reported. Uh, COVID-19 has spread to more than 200 countries and territories. And the latest count as of 60 minutes ago was 6.87 million cases with sadly uh, more than 398,000 deaths. In India, the tally is 235,000 plus with 6,642 deaths. There's been an explosion of knowledge like we have never known before. In the 159 days, we've had one two deaths, nine, three, one papers, which is an average of 121 papers per day. And from India, we've had 853 papers. From HCQ to plasma therapy to remdesivir to uh, low molecular weight heparin to tocilizumab to steroids to ivermectin, nitazoxanide, novel therapies, everything that we want to know about will be discussed today. And if there is one CME that has it all, it is this Global Indian Physicians Collaborative CME. So let's get cracking. And to set the ball rolling, we have uh, my distinguished colleague, Dr. Sudhir Parekh. Dr. Sudhir Parekh, this seems to be a problem with his audio. Can you unmute Dr. Parekh? Yeah, uh, Dr. Parekh, can you hear us? No audio. Okay, well, we, we're going to request you to please uh, start. We can hear you, Sudhir Bhai. Okay. So, uh, please go ahead. Sudhir Hi, dear Bhai. friends. Uh, welcome to our COVID-19 uh, uh, webinar. Uh, COVID-19 is an unprecedented event we, we, we have never seen in our lifetime. The last pandemic this year was almost 100 years ago with the Spanish flu. Because of the speed and spread of the infection, we are in a unique situation where we have a moving target. We are learning about the disease as we treat it and care for the many patients at the same time. There are so many unanswered questions. Why do some patients get so sick while some have no symptoms at all? Why do the sick one all present with the different symptoms? Now is the time for the innovation and the global medical community to unite as a heroes against a common threat. So many different medications are being studied throughout the world from antiviral to antiparasitic, malarial medication to anti-inflammatory agents. We are all desperate to awaiting for the vaccine. And as we know, there are 10 big trials are going on about the, uh, looking for the a correct vaccine. Along with the pandemic, a mental health problem have ensured as a result of the fear, anxiety, and economic implications. We need to move forward. And what will help us to do so is the effective vaccine and the medical treatment. So let's. Uh, here, uh, 
our expert uh, panelist here today let's welcome them and uh, hear about the medical treatment and the vaccination thank you welcome everyone everyone thank you sudhir bhai sudhir bhai is one of the pillars of gapio uh, he is the chairman of parik worldwide media itv gold channel he is a very well known expert in allergy he's been awarded the padam shri the pravasi bhartiya samman the ls island medal of uh, honor and the title I request everyone to please be on mute uh, and uh, he is currently the secretary general of gapio it gives me great pleasure to welcome my dear friend dr sudhakar uh, sudhakar is an american board certified uh, internist and a specialist with his fellowship and board certification in gastroenterology he practices in georgia and sudhakar will take over as president of api later on in this month over to you sudhakar to uh, take over for the next three talks please good morning anup and welcome you all and thank you again my name is anup mensh sudhakar journal gada income person for api yeah we all know that you know, currently in globally 6.7 million people have been diagnosed with covid we are learning every day day to day and see what the experts going to say today the first speaker is dr indrapal chabra he is a internist from new york he is a clinical assistant professor of medicine hofstra north shore lig school of medicine in the united states and chabra is a president of the lafert medical associate practices he is the man can tell exactly what is covid he took care of more than 200 cases in his practice till today probably more and see what dr chabra going to say about the clinical presentation of covid welcome chabra can you un unmute please dr yeah. chabra un unmute yeah. yeah yeah i'm going to thank you 5 minutes precisely because this is a really tight program and we have satguru exactly at 9 pm so we have to finish well in it. in in time sure so thank you i'll try to uh, go through this so these are a few cases that i have uh, uh, taken care of in my uh, uh, in my presentation at the hospital so let me just slide start the slide show can everybody see this okay good thank you so what i wanted to focus on is the vitals that we were looking at especially the desaturation and then the blood pressure in the labs we were looking at uh, the liver abnormalities renal failure and also the elevated d dimer crp and ferritin if that was elevated then the patient Can probably has covid even if the swab was negative so this was the algorithm that was started off by our institution it's a busy slide i uh, hope this can be shared later on i will not go into the details but some of the drugs that are mentioned here you'll be hearing a lot more details about those drugs later on in today's uh, speakers So jumping right into the patients. My first patient was a very sick patient in the throes of cytokine storm and I want to show you how interleukin blockers they can work. This is a 66 year old gentleman, he's a retired pulmonologist of Indian origin, past history of hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. He had an nephrectomy done last year in November for a transitional cell carcinoma. He de developed fever and after 2 days he was diagnosed with covid. and of course like any other indian doctor he took hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin at home before he came to the hospital and his dyspnea got worse and that's how he ended up in the hospital uh he was hypoxic and on day 3 his saturation dropped to 65% while he was brushing his teeth in the hospital i was able to procure him into the trial for cerumab which is an il6 blocker and in 2 days his hypoxia got better and in 10 days he was able to be discharged home although he did need some oxygen when he went home my second patient this is a cat scan by the way and if you look at the sides you see the ground glass opacities that everybody talks about in radiology the second patient this is just to show that you have got to be careful with these drugs these are very strong immunosuppressors and opportunistic infections can occur this was a dear patient of mine from my clinic 63 year old gentleman again an indian gentleman Plasma surgery of coronary artery disease. He had a stent put in in 2014. After that, he changed his life around, and he was a very energetic guy. Asthma, hypertension, developed dyspnea and cough. When he came to the hospital, his saturation was only 92% on the pulse ox. Within a few hours, his hypoxia got worse. He was started on hydroxychloroquine in the hospital. The next day, his condition kept on getting worse. I had started on high dose steroids, and I also started on Anakendra, which is an IL-1 blocker. 
you uh, intermittent pro positioning, proning as they call it, it, did not get any better. I had to give him one dose of tocilizumab. That was our protocol. Within seven days, he got intubated. It was taken to the ICU. He developed shock. His blood pressure was very low, requiring very high dose of pressors, multiple pressors. Developed right sided pneumothorax, and his blood cultures grew a bug called granulocytola NDSS, which is a type of a streptococcus, close to streptococcus. He kept on getting worse, developed renal failure, went on to be on dialysis. Uh, after about 14 days, our institution was approved for the plasma trial. However, even after the plasma, he died within a few hours. And this is this is his x-ray that shows the pneumothorax on the right side. So his third patient, 58-year-old lady, past history of hypertension, came with cough and dyspnea. She had a fever, saturating only 90% on pulse ox, required non-rebreather oxygen at 10 liters per minute. And when uh, she was admitted, intermittent prone positioning, that helped a little bit, not enough. And the third day, I was able to enroll her in the remdesivir trial. In less than 24 hours, her condition got better. And then in five days, she went home not requiring any oxygen at all. And this was the x-ray that shows the ground glass opacities in her. So in the end, what I want you to take away is keep a very high degree of suspicion. If you have a patient with unexplained fever, cough, any other symptoms, these patients get very sick very quickly. Cytokine storm, you have to be afraid of that. And how do you identify the patient is going into cytokine storm by looking at the hypoxia, CRP, ferritin. And don't be in a rush to put them on a ventilator. That causes trouble, such as pneumothorax, pneumomedestinum. I've had patients who have developed severe subcutaneous emphysema. The whole top part of the body had emphysema in that skin. And renal failure is a very big problem, especially in diabetics. And last but not the least, coagulopathy. Make sure you check the D-dimer when the patient goes home. And in the end, I would like to say, please take care of yourself. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabla. It's a wonderful and a very practical uh, presentation. And uh, I think we're going to hold the questions to the end of the uh, discussion. And our next speaker is Dr. Indra Nil Chakravarti. Dr. Chakravarti is a consultant pulmonologist and director of medical education at St. George University Hospital London and senior lecturer at the Postgraduate Medical School, University of uh, Hertfordshire. Dr. Chakravarti also a deputy postgraduate uh, post dean in North London for Health Education in England. And he awarded the President Medal by Royal College of Physicians London in 2019 for promoting excellence and quality assurance of medical education. Indeed, it is it is very, very debatable uh, topic of hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis therapy. Let's see what you're going to say. Dr. Chakravarti, please go ahead. I need to unmute myself. Uh, Hello, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity um, to talk about something which is really changing almost every hour. Um, I come from the same uh, place that my previous speaker came from. So I'm a clinician first. I'm a pulmonologist. I, as, as you know, I, I work in the front line of, of uh, patients. And like everyone here, I'm looking for something to do to help my patients. So I'm going to talk in the next five minutes just on just basically touch on chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, mainly hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19, what we know now and what I would view as the uh, practical aspect of this uh, therapy. Um, so let's go um, first to, um, so I'm going to talk about the mechanism of action. So we need to understand why chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine would be effective in this situation. I'll just touch quickly on that. And I'll touch on the uh, a few studies which show effectiveness um, of um, these treatments in COVID patients, then I'm going to talk mostly about prophylaxis. So, um, four aminoquinoline antimalarials have been around for a long time, um, both as antimalarials and as disease modifying agents in connective tissue disorders, and it's um, most rheumatologists are very familiar with usage and and in my case, as a pulmonologist, I've used the same. 
In, it has been included in clinical trials, and one of the bigger trials that are happening in UK at present are, has a four, four arms, and one arm includes um, hydroxychloroquine. It has been used, we know, in prophylaxis for health workers um, in India uh, and in South Korea, and has a significant controversy um, been around between the regulators, and I'm going to touch a little bit on that. It has been temporarily withdrawn and now being reintroduced, so um, the goalpost is changing for this drug um, almost daily. So how does it work? The first um, um, concept is that it's a chemical, it's a base, and once it gets into the cells, it increases the pH, uh, both of the endosome and also uh, in the lysosomes. And by increasing the pH, it, it interferes with the cellular receptors of SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus um, accessing the cells and therefore blocks viral infection. This has been shown clearly in in vitro studies. We also know that it inhibits the quinone reductase um, enzymes and therefore um, reduces the um, you know biosynthesis of uh, a transmembrane protein and therefore it prevents uh, access to the cells by the virus. It inhibits catepsin, which are important in leading to the cytokine response. And also um, it interferes with the um, virion assembly. So in vitro cells, there is good evidence that um, it would be effective. This is a, an excellent uh, diagram. Uh, which shows, um, you know, what I just mentioned about that, and it's in the Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. I won't go into that at the moment, but if you're willing, wanting to look at that, this is a good place to go. So we know that it decreases, um, you know, viral replication, viral infection, and can also reduce inflammatory markers or cytokine response. So therefore, it has a significant advantage. The advantage of hydroxychloroquine over chloroquine is in its reduced um, retinal uh, deposition and therefore faster clearance uh, and less retinopathy. Moving quickly on to, so FDA, as you know, um, although said there was no adequate um, uh, uh, you know, medication at the early stage of this condition, approved um, the use of COVID-19 in hospital um, setting patients and therefore uh, it has been in use. In the UK, we also can use it within a uh, trial setting. Why is there a worry about uh, hydroxychloroquine, especially um, in combination with macrolides? It is particularly due to the um, cardiac risk, which comes from an increased QT prolongation, and that leads to uh, ventricular fibrillation. We also know that this is quite a rare occurrence, it's uh, overall, the incidence is about three per million, uh, and it's also supposed to be double in, in women. In patients who have established coronary artery disease or hyperkalemia or heart failure, it's particularly um, um, dangerous in those patients. But the risk is quite small if you look at overall risk. So where is the evidence that um, hydroxychloroquine works in um, COVID-19 situations? The first study from China, which looked at 62 patients who were given five days of 400 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine per day, demonstrated that there was improvement in fever and pneumonia, and only two patients had mild adverse reactions. Then we look at the Marseille study, and if you look um, here, again, there's a combination of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin combined with hydroxychloroquine alone and compared with control arm. They looked at um, nasopharyngeal carriage by PCR testing, and it showed that in combination of with hazithromycin, there was a reduction uh, down to 100, by 100% of the um, virus uh, from the nasopharyngeal airways. Now, further on, the same, same group have looked at a 1,000 patients, and they report 92% virological cure in this group, and they only report a 5% people with a prolonged viral carriage. Now, prophylaxis, um, there's an interesting study uh, published by the in Indian Journal of uh, Medical Research looking at 20,000 asymptomatic healthcare workers. And again, 
in a case control model using 350 cases, they showed that there was a significantly reduced uh, risk of uh, COVID-19 amongst healthcare workers who were given prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine. And they also demonstrated a dose-response relationship. Uh, the next um, work was done in South Korea, which uh, looked at one single exposure from a hospital social worker. And, and 211 contacts were given uh, hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis, and no one developed um, COVID-19 in that group. Again, a very recent study looking at 800 cases of people with uh, an exposure to 10 minutes or more of um, you know, within six feet of patients with COVID-19, uh, where there were either no personal protection or very limited personal protection. They were all given uh, four days of uh, hydroxychloroquine and uh, they were followed up with uh, PCR uh, and they were found to have uh, 12 to 14 percent between the control group and the treatment group. So there was no real difference between uh, the number of people who went on to have uh, the disease. And 40 percent reported gastrointestinal symptoms in the people given hydroxychloroquine. And this is the NEJM paper. So at present, there's significant um, difference of opinion between the regulatory bodies. In Europe, um, there is very limitation in access to hydroxychloroquine and outside of trials in the UK, we are not able to use it. Um, President Trump has a, obviously a different view about that and he feels that this is obviously a biggest game changer. But if we are looking at the, I must mention the Mandeep Mehra's paper in the Lancet, which showed, um, you know, based on Sergiusphere's data, 93,000 patients from 671 hospitals. And the biggest problem was the significant higher risk of mortality in the people treated with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Now, this came at a time when the trials were in place and majority of trials pulled out, pulled out hydroxychloroquine from their arms, including in the UK. Now we know that this data may not be as accurate as it has been reported, and therefore we are revisiting uh, or restarting um, in involvement of uh, hydroxychloroquine in this area. And this particular um, trial and retraction of the data has done huge damage uh, to the credibility uh, of hydroxychloroquine in this particular question. This is my last slide. So as a clinician, what is the question that I'm looking at? If, I, if there is a drug which is safe and inexpensive and can be given to you know, lots and lots of people and it reduces transmission and improves global health, then it's a fantastic solution. Is it permissible to take a controlled risk? And I'm talking here about the cardiac risk of using this. Um, yes, um, the risk is quite small. It's possible to do that. But then in terms of prophylaxis, are we in a position to say that safely patients with uh, COVID-19 can be treated uh, with this condition? I'm not sure we know the answer to that. Perhaps there are perhaps better drugs to use in this situation. And finally, am I going to use it for Prophylaxis, I think post-exposure prophylaxis is justifiable in this situation, uh, perhaps currently, but mass prophylaxis probably we're not ready yet. The risks are too high. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chakravarti, uh, outstanding uh, presentation. Um, I think again, you know, we'd like to hold the questions for end of the discussion, end of the other discussions. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Madhavi Gorisu. Dr. Gorisu is a hematology oncologist at University of Connecticut, United States, and uh, works at the Starling Physician Hartford Hospital. He is currently serving as the president of Connecticut Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. I want to say one thing: uh, in the early part of COVID in the United States, ARPI took a great initiative. And in fact, we promote the importance of plasma treatment, uh, particularly COVID, sick, sick patient, COVID patient. Madhavi, the main anchor for RP, took the task. Nobody can do any better job than uh, Dr. Gursu. Dr. Gursu, please go ahead and present on plasma therapy. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was such a warm uh, introduction. Uh, can you hear me, guys? 
again a very good morning good evening to all my esteemed colleagues from all over the globe wow close to 500 participants that is amazing what a good job so i have started my timer so that i will not uh, go anything beyond the very valuable time so like what dr general gada has mentioned i think and uh, what dr sibal has uh, mentioned we are never have been in this kind of learn on the go and doing as terrific job as we all can so talking about one of the valuable tools to support our covid-19 uh, patients both who are uh, sick prophylaxis will go over a little bit so then the question comes uh, we do not have any published uh, uh, data as much for the covid-19 patients and um, so based on what have we started this journey giving this uh, treatment to our patients and again being a hematologist oncologist and probably like all in our specialties the value of multidisciplinary care i think this particular situation how we all have rallied from different specialties to kind of give the best supportive uh, and the treatment for our patients because uh, like you know these antibiotics these other of uh, the interleukin inhibitors i think time alone has to tell us what each uh, treatment modality has how much of the weight in helping the patients but having said that so let's take a look at what the history has been in the role of convalescent plasma i e the plasma from a recovered patient to help another sick patient is this totally new doesn't look like because as i have put in my slides couple of studies from 1932 to the most recent is that uh Uh, in uh, uh, the study published in JAMA in 1932, where uh, the serum was given to the uh, patient suffering from polio, and then came the study in 1935 for the measles patients, and uh, then came in 2010 for the uh, treatment for the uh, influenza patients. and in 2016 not to a long ago was the uh, immunotherapy for the uh, the middle east and respiratory virus the mers virus and the most recent in 2018 was the study for the ebola virus part so through all this uh, when in what it was approximately um, end of march and early um, uh, april that fda has uh, given the initiative for the uh, eind the uh, emergence indication to enroll a uh, patients for the plasma therapy part so based on this data that passive immunotherapy helps patients recover in a quicker way and also earlier the treatment that they were better so as of yesterday when i uh, looked once again before i finalized my slides i do not think there have been any established uh, hundreds of patients enrolled studies to show the data of the plasma therapy so i took it as an example of this particular study by duan atal and his colleagues the study from the wuhan um, where this is a very small study agreed only like 10 patients but it gives the gist of what my esteemed colleagues before me kind of went over what they are monitoring in the acutely ill patients so um i thought i'll just put this as a snapshot again as you see at the one side of the screen is the uh, improvement of the radiologic findings the ground glass opacities in patients who have received the plasma convalescent plasma therapy this um, the median time between the um, uh, uh, the covid symptom uh, onset and the plasma therapy was like 16 days but i would like to mention that later when they analyze earlier the patients received the treatment they were better off and at the other side of the screen you will see 
the different um, uh, parameters that are being monitored, which is the C-reactive protein, the lymphocyte improvement, the saturation, the transaminase as part. So it looks like we are already crossing the time limit. So what is the uh, donor registry? Uh, looking for the donor eligibility is the diagnostic test with the nasopharyngeal swab or the positive serologic test for the antibodies. And the criteria should be the resolution of the symptoms of the donor at least 14 days before. And remember, a negative rest test for COVID-19 is not necessary. And this is a quick snapshot of how uh, from a recovered patient, the plasma is collected, the serum is being given, remember, both to the prophylaxis as well as the acutely ill patients. The reason I have put this snapshot of different trials is that Remember, several trials are being done in different settings from the emergency room to the outpatients, to the children, and not only the acute sick. And I think in uh, time alone, we'll be getting the results of these published studies, which will show the safety. I think so far the signals have been that it is not unsafe and probably a reasonably efficacious treatment to help in the symptom recovery part. Uh, well, how much each component of the treatment modality had a role to play in the improvement once we have the published studies, we'll know. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, can everybody hear Dr. Siebel? No, unmute. You're muted. You're muted. Unmute. So I, I was just saying thanks, Sudhakar, and thanks, Madhvi, Indranil, and uh, IPS for the talks and also for uh, uh, making sure that you adhere to the five-minute time slot. For the next set, we have uh, my dear friend, the dynamic president of API, an interventional neuroradiologist based in Chicago. Uh, Suresh Reddy Garu uh, to do the honors. Over to Suresh. Suresh, unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Please go ahead. Can you hear? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank yes. you. Uh, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank my counterparts uh, from Global Physicians, Dr. Anupam Sibal from United Kingdom, Dr. Ramesh Mehta, Dr. Anju Agarwal from Australia. This global education endeavor has been made possible by this amazing collaboration. This is a classic example of the saying, the more you share, the more you learn. Thank you again, the physician leaders from all over the world. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. Dr. Sanjay Agarwal is an experienced and accomplished board certified critical care specialist, interventional pulmonologist, and sleep specialist practicing in California, currently most active as frontline warrior in the intensive care units with the Kaiser Group of Hospitals. Dr. Sanjay Agarwal has first-hand experience of using remdesivir in SARS-COVID infected patients as well as other treatments. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to invite Dr. Sanjay Agarwal to speak on the role of REM disorder in the management of COVID. Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. Hello. Good morning, everybody from, from the US. Since the first reports of the COVID-19 in December 2019, novel coronavirus has caused a pandemic as declared by WHO on March 11th and with devastating medical, social, and economic effects. So um, Remdesivir was developed by Gilead Sciences, is an investigational broad spectrum antiviral drug. Intravenous Remdesivir was previously studied for Ebola virus disease in 500 volunteers in which it was adequately tolerated, but less effective than several monoclonal antibody at that time. It has shown promise in animal models for treating other severe coronavirus illnesses like MERS and SARS. 
And apart from coronavirus group of family of, of viruses, Remdesivir also is active against pyloviruses, paramyxoviruses, and pneumoviruses. With this working background, it has been used on the COVID-19 cases throughout the world. It has gained significant attention as a, as a treatment modality in this pandemic. So let's delve a little bit about as to what Remdesivir is and what data we have for that. So Remdesivir is a nucleotide prodrug that undergoes conversion to a pharmacologically active nucleoside triphosphate intracellularly, as you can see in the slide. And the triphosphate active molecule is incorporated into the nascent RNA chain by the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase, commonly known as RDRP, in the RNA chain, which causes termination of viral application. And in vivo, it's shown that it can be incorporated multiple times before the causing chain termination, and somewhat it is delayed. So what we know for remdesivir is a prodrug of adenosine nucleotide with broad spectrum antiviral activity, both in vitro and in animal models against coronavirus family pathogens such as MERS and SARS. In its active form, the triphosphate, it is incorporated into SARS-CoV-2 RNA chain via RDRP, leading to delayed chain termination. Remdesivir has also shown activity against SARS-CoV-2 in vitro in viral E6 cells line, as well as in clinical improvement in the primate model of rhesus macaques. But I just want to mention that Remdesivir is still an investigational agent, which is not approved by the FDA or EMA, and its safety and efficacy is still yet to be determined in humans. At this moment, Remdesivir enjoys only the you know, EUA status by the, by the FDA in the USA. So the timeline of Remdesivir, in April 29, 2020, the NIH, National Institute of Health, released a preliminary data from the um, adaptive COVID-19 trial, treatment trial, or ACTT1 trial, which showed that it was about 31% faster time to recovery in the patients who received remdesivir versus placebo, or 11 versus 15 days, which is a p-value of 0 0.001, and it is very effective. Survival benefit was about 8% in remdesivir group versus 11.6% in placebo group. It reached, it is, mortality benefit is seen, there's trend, but it did not reach the p-value. Based on this, the FDA came out with the emergency use authorization, or the EUA, in COVID-19 patients for 10 days for ICU patients who are more sicker versus five days for non-ICU patients. And based on these two, the remdesivir was um, uh, donated from Gilead to the US government about 607,000 doses were donated for about 55,000 to 100,000 patients. And by May, 8, May 18th, they increased to almost a million doses because as the cases jumped in. Based on the previous two speakers, I also wanted to mention here that the remdesivir is very, um, very uh, tough to produce, very hard production is tedious. It's a time consuming and resource intensive involving sequential chemical synthesis process with some individual steps taking weeks to complete. So Gilead is trying to overcome that by providing voluntary licensing for mass production to five different companies in India and Pakistan. And hopefully we should be getting able to meet the supply and demand over time. So the Compassionate Use Program was published in uh, uh, NEGM on April 10th. It, was, it is sponsored by Gilead, uncontrolled open label program with the, without a predetermined number of patient sites or duration. There are specific inclusion criteria listed as you can see from here, and the data was evaluated on this cohort, which include clinical status assessment by six points ordinal scale mentioned here, status from discharge to the 0.6 of this uh, death. And this was ordinal scale used in pretty much all the studies. Mortality was also assessed as well as adverse events. So in this, uh, basically, I wanted to sub, um, put all data together, um, mentioning here um, that there was a, out of all these 61 patients, enrolled, 53 patient data was reported at median days of 18 days. You can see that invasive group, about 34 patients were included in that, of which 19 patients were had significant improvement. Overall, 68% people improved. Seven out of the 53 people data was reported. That is 13% people died. Six of them belong in the invasive group, which included intubation as well as ECMO. And the ambient air or low flow oxygen or non-invasive methods or high flow oxygen, this was about, they, they tend to improve better. The mortality was 
more in people who are older than 70 years or had comorbid conditions. You can see the further data in NGM. Second simple study was published. This was on to assess the Part A and Part B program. Part A was involved about 400 patients and 197 in longer trial of remdesivir, 10 days, and 200 patients were involved in the five days trial. Again, inclusion and exclusion criteria as mentioned. And in this, the primary endpoint was assessed by seven point owner scale in 14 days. And it showed that the efficacy and safety eventually, there was no significant difference between five days course or 10 day course of remdesivir for severe COVID pneumonia, not requiring mechanical ventilation in baseline, no difference. Baseline characteristics were similar in both the groups, except that in the 10 day group, there were higher proportion of patients who had hypertension or severe disease categories. In safety wise, there was transient elevation of liver enzymes were observed in patients with 2.5% uh, in five day and 3.6% in 10 day group respectively. Patients also experienced greater grade three elevation in creatinine and decline in creatinine clearance in 10 day group. Overall, five day remdesivir course was not significantly different in efficacy versus 10 day course for severe COVID pneumonia who are not on mechanical ventilation at baseline. But the 10-day course could be more beneficial in patients who progress to mechanical ventilation. I just wanted to highlight a few of the studies which is coming up. The Chinese study was published in, in uh, May 16th in Lancet, which was with uh, um, um, remdesivir versus placebo, was um, closed early, underpowered, and no change in clinical outcome was found. I also talked about the ACT1, ACT2 trial. Further trials are coming up with a solidarity discovery, which includes remdesivir with other other components. And I'm way past my time. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, and um, keep safe. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, uh, for this amazing talk. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Senthur Nambi. Dr. Nambi is an infectious disease specialist at Apollo Hospital, Chennai, India. Dr. Nambi was previously an assistant professor of medicine at Chettinad Medical College, Padur, India. Dr. Nambi has published many research papers to his credit. Dear fellow physicians, please join me to invite Dr. Nambi to speak on antiretrovirals and low molecular weight heparin. Dr. Nambi. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sibal, for the opportunity. and. Uh... I will just be sure. Thanks, Dr. Sibyl, for the opportunity, and thanks, uh, Dr. Suresh Reddy, for the introduction. And this is a cartoon that most of the physicians managing COVID should be familiar with. And uh, with antiretrovirals, uh, the site of action is RNA translation, and that is the conversion of polypeptides to the non structural proteins. Accept the protease enzyme. Going on to the lopinavir retinavir, the other antiretrovirals that has been studied is gerunavir and atazanavir. Unfortunately, not much uh, uh, data for it. So I would just focus only on lopinavir retinavir. As I said earlier, it acts on the protease enzyme, the RNA translation process, and there is no in vitro studies for SARS CoV 2. Uh, but this molecule has been earlier studied for SARS CoV 1 and MERS CoV uh, with some limited success. Uh, with respect to the real world data, with respect to COVID, and we have this publication, a randomized controlled trial, around 200 patients on lopinavir, retinavir. What they found was uh, when they compared that with the uh, control arm, it did not make much of a difference. But one criticism against this uh, study was most patients with lopinavir, retinavir uh, were started much later in the course of the disease. The median duration when lopinavir retinavir was started was around 13 days. This is another study from Hong Kong, which again looked into lopinavir retinavir versus a triple drug combination of lopinavir retinavir plus ribavirin and interferon. Uh, but let me reiterate, yes, this triple drug combination had some effect, uh, in, but this is not a clinical study because that is what I would presume. Why I'm saying that is, this looked into virological clearance. They, what they were trying to look was uh, the clearance of the virus by RT-PCR. But did it have any clinical correlation? Most of us do not know. Why I'm saying that is why you did not replicate a real life scenario is because very few patients required oxygen in this study. 
and as, a, as far as I know, there's only one patient on ventilator. And uh, so that is the data with respect to uh, this study from Hong Kong. So my thoughts on antiretrovirals or lopinavir retinavir is no clear benefit with the present data. Uh, could be a treatment option if initiated early. Probably we need to wait for the WHO solidarity trial. If there is any positive news for lopinavir retinavir from it. Going on to low molecular weight apparel, COVID is new, so would be this terminology called COVID-associated hemostatic abnormality, CAHA. And um, infections do cause DIC, but with COVID, it's slightly different. Thrombocytopenia is at best moderate. Fibrinogen levels tend to be higher. G-dimer levels tend to be much higher. The prolongation of PTA, PTT tends to be modest. The prothrombotic state generally predominates, and that is a big learning for clinicians like us. And this is something that we would do routinely in patients with uh, COVID who gets admitted into the hospital, look into the D-dimer because the D-dimer levels at the admission definitely predicts the in-hospital mortality. Anything more than two is not a good news as far as patients are concerned. And uh, what does it mean being a prothrombotic state is we find all forms of pulmonary embolism. Let it be a segmental pulmonary embolism, subsegmental pulmonary embolism, low bar or a central PE. In addition to it, we could have deep venous thrombosis, which could be either proximal or distal. So COVID is a definite prothrombotic state. So what do we do with that? There is definite mortality benefit in patients whom we put on prophylactic heparin. Prolonged APTD is not a contraindication to anticoagulation in this subset. Start prophylactic low molecular weight heparin immediately in all admitted patients unless they have any bleeding. Anyone admitted to the wards, you would look into once daily dosing. Someone who in the ICU, you would look into minimum of twice daily dosing of low molecular weight heparin. So how would we manage these patients with coagulopathy? You would have to do the basic test. Let it be the D-dimer, prothrombin time platelet counts at least once in two days. And uh, how would we manage? Where do we place the low molecular weight apparent? So for all patients get, getting hospitalized, the ward is going to be once daily. In the ICU, it's going to be at least twice daily. In addition to it, in anyone who has a rapid respiratory deterioration requiring intubation, ventilation, or a change in baseline from their oxygenation status with high, di high D dimer, would always think of venous thromboembolism. So if we could prove it by either an ultrasound of the venous system or a CT angiography, it's fine. But for whatever reasons, the diagnostic testing is not possible. If there is no bleeding risk, then we should consider therapeutic anticoagulation in patients who have a rapid clinical deterioration plus high D dimer. So to, to summarize how we'd be placed the low molecular weight heparin in outpatient, generally not a role, but still you would consider in obese patients who are not going to be ambulant after discharge. A pregnant individual definitely it's a strong consideration. Someone who has already been on uh, molecular weight heparin for some other reasons. So in that situation, an outpatient low molecular weight heparin may have a role. Otherwise, you would do those coagulation tests, D-dimer, prothrombin time, platelet counts. In any patient in the ward, you would do a standard uh, prophylaxis, whereas anyone in the ICU or with ARDS, you would do an escalated uh, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. Someone with a confirmed venous thromboembolism or a presumed PE, you would go for a therapeutic dose anticoagulation. With that, I end my lecture. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Nambi, and uh, for the amazing talk. And uh, I have a personal invitation of my own. Um, I would like to personally invite you all, the speakers and the audience, to join the first virtual summit organized by RP in collaboration with GAPIO and BAPIO from June 18th to June 28th. That's uh, closing in on COVID. That is a title. And uh, thank you, Dr. Nambi, for the very informative talk. Now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Babu Abraham. Dr. Abraham was trained in pulmonary medicine in the United Kingdom and underwent a fellowship training in critical care medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. Abraham is a senior consultant in pulmonary and critical care medicine at Apollo Hospital, Chennai, India. 
Dr. Abraham is an examiner for diplomat of National Board in Critical Mare Medicine conducted by the National Board of Examiners. Dear friends, please join me to invite Dr. Abraham to speak on tocilizumab and steroids. Uh, Dr. Abraham. Dr. Reddy, I am not able to get a login. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can do the audio. Please go ahead and do the audio. Sorry, I am not, not able, able to, to get a login. Something yeah, I hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I'll be able to share my screen. Uh, Anupam, uh, should we just go with the audio or uh, we'll get a different speaker? Not able to hear you, Anupam. You're muted, Anupam. Thank you, I'm calling. Babu, you could, you could just go on and uh, read out from your slides and make a oral presentation. Seasoned speaker that you are, I'm sure uh -huh. you do. No, I can do that, but I will not be able to share. Yeah. The slide. No problem. Yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Abraham. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I uh, did not know what happened. Okay, now steroid and tocilumab are the two uh, 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 immunosuppressants which we are trying to use in COVID. Now, if you look at where we want to use these immunosuppressants in any infection, it's time when the viremia has settled and the, uh, and the uh, inflammatory process is starting. When the inflammatory process starts, that's when the, the lungs get affected. So we are planning to use this uh, medications at the time when you start seeing hypoxia setting in. So most of the time, the decision is not whether we should use, it is when to use it and at what dose to use it. So looking at the evidence, there's very clear evidence that uh, there is no much effect uh, benefit from using steroids in a corona infection that's seen from the SARS-1 in 2003. Uh, there was uh, actually no benefit. Then in MERS, again, no benefit. Even in influenza, when you look at it, it was in fact increased mortality when you use steroids. So I do not know why we continue to have our fetish with steroids in viral pneumonia. Now, the recent uh, COVID-2 infection, uh, the corticosteroids use, the first uh, uh, the uh, systemic review which looked at it had four studies, of, out of which all were retrospective observational studies. Two were negative, uh, showed that steroids could do harm. One did not have any benefit. And one study alone showed that if used in a very uh, severe pneumonia, could reduce mortality. Now, recently, there is a study which has come out of Detroit, which looked at using short course of steroid very early in the disease. And that is a sort of quasi-experimental pre- and post out of study, which showing some promising results. The, it showed that when you use steroids in a dose of um, uh, methylprednisolone equivalent of 0.5 to 1 uh, milligram per kilo for three days, it reduced death, reduced respiratory failure, and reduced escalation of, of disease. So there was a composite outcome uh, improvement, and each of these uh, primary uh, outcomes like death, respiratory failure and disease worsening improved and the number needed to treat was eight. So this is one of the first studies uh, which is showing some promise and we need more uh, randomized control study to say whether steroids will actually work. Coming to tocilizumab. Uh, tocilizumab is an IL-6 uh, antagonist used well in rheumatology. Uh, and uh, showing from a very good uh, effect in rheumatology. And in ICU, we have seen that whenever we extrapolate therapy, we always burn our fingers. And this is what exactly we are doing. We are using tocilumab, which is shown to be a very good IL-6 antagonist, is being used in COVID just because the, most of the COVID patients who are sick has raised IL-6. And the studies looking at Tocilumab in COVID-19, there is one random uh, systemic uh, review, uh, which has, uh, again, six studies. 
two of which were observe, uh, observe, observational uh, retrospective analysis and four were just case reports. Those were um, very poor studies uh, from, which, from which we can make no conclusion. Recently, there is another study again coming out of Michigan, which has looked at using um, tocilumab uh, in a, in an observational control study, and that study is again showing some promise. It has shown a decreased mortality when tocilumab is used in sick patients, patients who are on ventilator with respiratory failure at a dose of 8 mg per kilo as a single dose. Again, remember that this is an uncontrolled observational study, so we will need randomized control studies to tell us whether we are going to use, uh, whether we can use tocilumab or not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Babu. Uh, despite the glitch, I think you made a fantastic presentation and the message was loud and clear. Uh, so deeply appreciate this. Uh, we move on to our next set of uh, um, talks. And to introduce the next three speakers, I have the privilege and honor of introducing uh, our respected colleague, Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam. Dr. Nand Kumar Jairam is a well-known surgeon. Uh, he is also the CEO and Group Medical Director of Columbia Asia Group of Hospitals and is the Vice President of CAPIO. Over to you, Dr. Nath Kumar. Thank you, Anupam. It is my pleasant duty to introduce Dr. Sunita Naradi, who is an ID specialist in the Puro Hospital, certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine in Infectious Diseases. And her expertise includes nosocomial infections, immunocompromised hosts, HIV, complicated infections like fungal infections, MDR tuberculosis, H1N1, and travel medicine. Let's hear Dr. Naradi. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, today I'm going to be talking primarily about using repurposed drugs for COVID, uh, the ones that don't have anyone to back, back up. Uh, most of these are in principle, so we'll need to do a lot of research for a lot of these things. So let's move on. Starting with ivermectin. Uh, we have heard a little bit of ivermectin and to understand what ivermectin is and how it works. Uh, ivermectin is a drug that has been, we all know is uh, anti-parasitic, but it also has antibacterial, anti-cancer and antiviral properties. It has shown some activity against a bunch of different viruses, including Zika, West Nile, Chikungunya, Dengue and so on. But how does it work in, uh, uh, in coronaviruses? What we do know uh, that happens in coronaviruses is the virus typically binds to the imp alpha and beta 1 uh, proteins and thereby enters into the uh, nucleus of the cell and replicates. Ivermectin basically uh, prevents the binding of the uh, virus, virus to the uh, receptors and thereby entry into the cell wall, into the cell is restricted. Uh, so this is the principle which, with which it works and there after what else do we know? There have been in vitro studies uh, using ivermectin on um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2. And if you see this uh, uh, pictorial here, the uh, virus has significantly decreased on exposure to the ivermectin. And you have to remember here that this is an in vitro study and the dosage that they have used of ivermectin is not achievable in most uh, therapeutic doses. So uh, does it work? It probably works. Can we use it in real time? We still don't know at this point. We have to wait for more research to come out. What about other drugs? Nitrosoxanide. Now, nitrosoxanide is basically an antiparasitic and antiviral pro-drug. It potentiates interferon alpha and interferon beta production. It has previously shown to have some in vitro activity against MERS-CoV and other coronaviruses. Uh, in principle, nitrosoxanide, uh, when given at uh, uh, 600 mg twice a day for five days had shown to have some uh, uh, um, reduction of symptoms in influenza infection as well. In terms of using, uh, again, COVID, the therapeutic trials are ongoing. Moving on to that, uh, we all use this a lot for multiple different purposes, including chronic respiratory diseases, parasitic overdose, uh, acute bron bronchopulmonary disease, and so on. 
uh, at higher doses though, which is about 1200 milligrams, it has antioxidant properties through complex mechanisms and that can uh, combat conditions of oxidative stress. Uh, it has been used in, com in combination with conventional treatment for uh, community acquired pneumonia, where it showed that impro there's improved oxidative stress and inflammatory response. Uh, NAC inhibits uh, inflammatory markers like IL-8, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor, and so on, uh, in diseases like uh, influenza and respiratory syncytial virus as well. So uh, there is a uh, potential uh, role of NAC at a higher dose, uh, that's 1,200 milligrams per day in COVID-19 uh, as well, that potentially can help in cytokine storm syndrome and ARDS. Again, this is another principle that needs to be worked on. Uh, moving on to tetracyclines. Now, tetracyclines are basically uh, lipophilic antibiotics that are known to uh, chelate zinc compounds on uh, MMPs. Now, coronavirus relies heavily on MMPs for survival, cell infiltration, and cell addition, replication, uh, and many of which have zinc as part of their MMP complex. Tetracycline also has zinc chelating properties, and this can potentially aid in inhibiting COVID-19 infections in humans and thereby limits their ability to replicate within the host. And tetracycline may also be able to inhibit RNA replication uh, on positive sense single stranded RNA like the COVID-19. It has anti-inflammatory properties as well. So moving on to doxycycline in specific, it's a second generation tetracycline with broad, broad spectrum antimicrobial including antiviral properties. And we all know that it also has anti-inflammatory properties. In vitro, it has shown some activity against other viruses, including dengue, chikungunya, and so on. So there is a potential role of using the doxycycline along with chloroquine, maybe uh, as a prophylaxis. Again, all of this is a, in principle. We need to do. To summarize, tetracyclines can be potential therapeutic agents for COVID, and uh, uh, and they can potential. They are safe, relatively safe agents, and that can be considered as uh, uh, optional drugs. Uh, again, investigation is uh, required uh, to see how this would work. This is an interesting article that came out on Pidotamid. There are a few articles that came out primarily from, from China. This is a, uh, what is Pidotamid? Pidotamod is an immunomodulator and it reduces acute exacerbation of uh, respiratory tract infection in pediatrics. Uh, Pidotamid disposable tablets were used occasionally in the treatment of two patients uh, with uh, suspected coronavirus pneumonia. And let me explain to you how this actually happened. And they say that they uh, had a curative effect. But if you look, actually look into this, this particular family had an uncle with them. And they learned, after the patient, uh, uncle visited them and left, they learned that the uh, uncle turned positive uh, for COVID. And they, uh, then the uncle left and found he was positive, the next patient family went into isolation. Now, the patient one in his family uh, who uh, developed symptoms first. Initially, he took some Chinese medicine and that did not make any difference. And symptoms continued to worsen. It included uh, being the branches, sweatness, cough, and stain. And he happened to have this Dotamon tablets with him at that point in time. And so he chose to take this, this medication and the symptoms resolved in 20 to 30 minutes. Subsequently, his wife also developed symptoms. And uh, but the wife was taken into the hospital and so she did not get the same medication. The mother in law developed symptoms and he gave the same medicine to the mother in law as well, and she also the uh, uh, symptoms of for mother in law. But the uh, interesting thing is both of them tested negative for RT PCR subsequently. The first patient who had changes consistent with C, uh, COVID on the CT, if you look at the antibody production, the first patient did not even produce antibodies. But they are really loaded to this antibodies. Uh, the wife who tested positive for COVID also did not produce antibodies. So, this is not anecdotal report, and make any decision based on this information. But this is an interesting uh, anecdotal So, to summarize, repurposed drugs are good options. Research is required. Unfortunately, there's no backing for these drugs by major companies. Uh, so, it's uh, left to the, their own. Uh, uh, trials, so we'll have to see where we go for, but some of these may be good options. Thank you, <coughs> Sunita, for exposing to us some of the other options and possibilities uh, 
of, of antibiotics in COVID. I'm sure that uh, only time will tell us how good or effective these are. It's now my pleasant duty to introduce Dr. Sainath Haranath, who is a pulmonologist and critical care specialist working at Hyderabad in Apollo hospitals as a senior consultant. He's an American board certified internal medicine, pulmonary medicine and critical care, and the medical director of e-access tele-ICU services. He's going to talk to us on more novel ideas, plasma pheresis, HPO transfusion. Dr. Harana. Hi, this is Dr. Sai. Thank you, Dr. Jairam Kumar, for uh, introducing me. And thank you, Dr. Sibal, for uh, this wonderful opportunity to share our information. Uh, just a quick check, audio uh, is OK? okay. Great. So I'm just going to quickly touch on novel ideas. I know we've all uh, fairly run out of uh, options. We've looked at all the drugs. And looking at everything so far, we may be left with only one or two options. It's like we're flying in a plane, and the pilots come back and say, guys, any ideas? So when we look at the novel concept, the plasma paresis, bloodletting, or giving a transfusion, blood giving, or perhaps just using high pressure oxygen, are these the options that are available? Now, if you're in Australia, you're probably ready to sleep. So if you can look at this slide, go hit the bed right after this. Plasma paresis is removal of large molecules of cells from the plasma. There are multiple complications. HPO or hyperbaric oxygen therapy is using a high pressure chamber to increase the oxygenation. And blood transfusion is not something we should be doing. There is no transfusion-related transmission. So people who have actually received blood have not shown any signs of coronavirus infection. And there is a possibility that donors are giving blood have asymptomatic infection, but the probability in the test that they've done has been slow and low. So the next concept we will talk about really is about plasma paresis, where several studies have come out of China. All these are, of course, case series where they've done plasma exchange and they've shown some results. The concept is that you're taking out the viral particles and replacing it with volume. Now, Turkey used it very successfully in a very specific instance of autoimmune meningoencephalitis in COVID-19. They showed an improvement in mental status. They also showed that the ferritin levels dropped. There is a nice editorial by uh, Keith in a recent article where he talks about an argument for therapeutic plasma exchange. They have been dealing with the concepts of uh, immunostimulation and immunoparalysis. In sepsis and other syndromes, we know that there is an initial uh, revving up of the immune system to fight the infection, and then there is a suppression. And they feel that maybe working on plasma exchange may be modulating that phenomenon. The controversy, though, is that sometimes what happens is that you're going to remove useful chemicals also. There is a study that was done with the H1N1 influenza virus in 2009 in children. That is where the concept came in. That they showed that there was an improvement in outcomes and patients were able to actually improve their oxygenation uh, and their respiratory failure reverse after using plasma exchange. There's multiple studies in clinicaltrials.gov which are looking at this. There's an Egyptian study looking at methylene blue uh, along the plasma exchange. There's a Spanish study recruiting uh, for a RCT for plasma exchange. And a US study is planned along with the drug called ruxolinitinib to work on plasma paresis. The concept also is of using lectin affinity plasma paresis for the MERS virus and the Marburg virus. They've shown that theoretically you could actually remove the virus using the binding of the virus to the lectin particles. And again, these are theoretical and for the coronavirus, you really don't know. But the idea seems to be fairly reasonable because you have an option to change the composition of the blood relatively quickly and perhaps decrease the viral load. There's also the concept that you may decrease the amount of inflammatory work that the body has to do if you remove the bolus of the viruses that are present in the system. Moving on to hyperbaric oxygen therapy, essentially the normal atmospheric pressure, as you know, is 760 millimeters of mercury. The oxygen dissolved in the blood is very minuscule. If you can actually increase the pressure, you can push more oxygen into the dissolved oxygen. And in a slide or two, I will show you what the concept is all about. What they've shown in a ch uh, Chinese uh, series is that they were able to prevent intubation in certain patients, and they actually managed to uh, get them off with BiPAP also. There are seven trials right now registered for this. The earliest one is already ongoing in Israel, and that ends in a few days, actually, in June 30th. And the theory is that you improve tissue oxygenation and improve the anti-inflammatory process. The Israeli study is using 2.2 times uh, the atmospheric pressure, 60 minutes twice a day for four days. And they're measuring cytokines. Of all the studies going on, this one seems the most detailed. The Swedish uh, Institute, Karolinska Institute, is also studying 200 participants. However, 
this RCT will not complete until the end of December 2021 or 22. So it looks like most of these people are doing a proper research in order to get a, a good outcome and they're extending it out, assuming that the corona epidemic is not going to end very soon. The next concept we want to talk about is blood transfusion. There are some case reports talking about giving blood to improve oxygenation. This is a disproven theory for several years, perhaps over a decade now, that blood is not helpful for oxygenation, except in extreme cases of extremely low anemia. But there have actually been people surviving with a hemoglobin less than one without getting blood transfusion, as long as there's a volume expansion. This is a physiology concept which talks about the relationship between oxygenation and oxygen saturation. The concept begins there saying that if you can actually increase the hemoglobin, perhaps you can increase oxygenation. It is an unproven uh, experimental phenomenon which we should not be indulging on. We should encourage blood donation, however, because it is still safe and people are actually, in the last three months, blood donation has decreased and that is a problem because they are going to need blood for other problems to be sorted. This is the final slide here which talks about the rate of oxygen delivery is dependent on the cardiac output, depends on your hemoglobin level, depends on your oxygen saturation and also depends on your dissolved oxygen. So this talk today has been talking about hyperbaric oxygen where you're actually working on the dissolved oxygen and it's a very minute component but if you're teetering on the edge of oxygenation, you may benefit from a little bit of a boost and I think there is some hope for this. In India, there are a few centers. The second concept is hemoglobin. The theory is that if you increase hemoglobin, it might work. But in practice, there are more side effects of hemoglobin because you're going to end up with volume-related acute lung injury, and I, I would not recommend that. And of course, the cardiac output is important. So in conclusion, I think uh, of all these three novel therapies, I believe hyperbaric oxygen may be of benefit, and plasma exchange may be something to look forward to. There are several HPO centers around the world. In India, there is a hyperbaric medicine organization. I think Apollo Delhi also has a center, and uh, any place where there's a Navy Institute will have a hyperbaric center. The practical difficulty of putting patients in and out is a whole another story. Plasma phoresis is widely available, and I believe the take-home messages continue to encourage blood donation, and let's keep our fingers crossed. Thank you very much again for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Harnath. Over to you, Anupam. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sai and Dr. Nandkumar. And we now move on to the next set of talks and to introduce the speakers, uh, it's a privilege to introduce Dr. Arungar. Uh, he's a well-known uh, biochemist uh, working in Vancouver. He's the medical director of the South Asian uh, Health Institute and he's an adjunct professor at Fraser Health Sciences. He's a member of the executive committee of GAPIO. So over to you, Dr. Arungar. Thank you, Anupam. It's a great privilege to welcome you all. Greetings from beautiful British Columbia. I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Randeep Gularia. Dr. Gularia is Padam Shri Randeep Gularia, rep reputed pulmonologist and well known figure in healthcare. He will be talking about containment strategies for India. Dr. Gularia is currently director of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Valeria is part of core team of top Indian officials reviewing and monitoring pandemic in the country and is involved in building strategies for prevention, containment, and management of COVID-19. Please welcome Dr. Valeria. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, uh, I'm, I don't have any slides to prepare because uh, we're in the thick of a pandemic and even in our hospitals at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, currently we have more than 800 patients admitted who are COVID positive and many of them are quite sick on ventilator. And uh, as you know, the number of cases in India, especially in cities like Delhi and Mumbai, has really increased a lot. But I'll be talking briefly and I'll just uh, mention what we've been doing as far as containment strategy for COVID-19 is concerned. Now, to begin with, it's something that one was prepared and was not prepared uh, as far as the pandemic is concerned. I remember that even almost 15 years ago, there was a lot of concern that we should have some preparation for a pandemic. This was basically when we had the SARS outbreak and when we had the H5N1, which is also known as avian influenza. H5N1, as you know, is also causes very severe ARDS and has... Uh, a uh, case fatality of our more than 60%. Luckily, that virus did not uh, mutate to become a pandemic virus, but that really caused a big scare as far as India and Southeast Asia was concerned. And that led to the government of India forming what is known as a joint monitoring group for outbreak, which was uh, chaired uh, by the Director General Health Services to keep and uh, uh, really have a, meet, a regular meeting or to see what they could do for any outbreak. 
And this evolved into looking at the H1N1 outbreak, the MERS outbreak, the Ebola outbreak that we had, and of course now as far as the pandemic is concerned. So when we had the outbreak of COVID-19, the group and the ministry very quickly actually inst instigated initial uh, monitoring of all international flights which were coming and the screening was started way back in uh, late January. Uh, subsequently, as the number of cases uh, increased, it was recommended that we should have an early lockdown and when the cases were not that many, India instituted a lockdown strategy which was across the country. Uh, this uh, strategy we had hoped would actually also help in decreasing the number of cases or bringing it down, but that did not work as uh, successfully as we would hope to. And this was basically because of the fact that we, had, we are a democracy and uh, it's not that you can enforce lockdown as aggressively as you would have liked to. And secondly, there were a lot of uh, unexpected events which happened despite the lockdown. But it really gave us opportunity as far as containment strategy was concerned to work and do things because the cases, the, the rise in cases was not as much as one had worried about or feared and we were able to flatten the curve to some extent. What we were able to do was build new and new labs as far as diagnosis and testing is concerned because that was something which was of utmost importance. And uh, when we started off, we had what was known as the VDRL, the Viral Diagnostic and Research Laboratories of the ICMR. And we were doing only around 10 to 20,000 tests a day. Uh, this was also, uh, these labs were uh, made when we were looking at H1N1. From 10 to, 10 to 20,000 tests a day, yesterday we did more than 1,37,000 tests per day. And this capacity we are hoping to double by the end of this month. So the number of tests that we have started doing has really been ramped up. All medical colleges, all CSR, uh, DBT, uh, DST labs have now been uh, enrolled and trained for testing. Even veterinary and the other uh, agriculture universities have also come on board to really increase India's capacity for testing. Along with that, we also realize that we will have to increase the hospital capacity. And as you've been hearing on during the talks, we don't have some uh, definite specific therapy. Um, a lot of treatment strategies have been tried all over the world. But one thing that we've realized that we will really need for our sick patients is having adequate oxygen uh, supply even at a district level. And over the last few weeks, this has been a major uh, push that we have what we call COVID care centers, COVID hospitals and COVID ICUs. And both the COVID hospitals and ICUs have to have full uh, beds with oxygen facilities even at a district level. And a lot of work was done in uh, making sure that this is done, including having ventilatory points. A training facility was also started and a lot of webinars were done uh, for doctors and nurses and for infection control practices also because healthcare workers need to be protected as much as possible. Uh, we also started a connect facility at the All Institute of Medical Sciences where we were having our pulmonologists, critical care specialists, uh, ID specialists who uh, working with doctors at the district hospital who could really advise them on management of these patients because it's a complicated disease which has systemic involvement and management requires a multi-speciality approach. So a lot of activities were done. A research group was also set up by the ICMR and we have now a large number of research projects. You, you saw the presentation of this study by in publishing the Indian Journal of Medical Research on hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic therapy. There is an ongoing trial on BCG vaccination in the elderly. We are also looking at ivermectin, um, uh, part of the solidarity trial. And ICMR has just completed a large zero surveillance study in all the districts of the country to see in the hot spots and the cold spots what is the antibody titers in our population and how much is there, uh, how much of uh, asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic cases have been there which have, who have recovered without any treatment. There are big challenges that we still face. We have ramped up our production capacity, but there is still a lot of work that we need to do. And the challenges are more and more because of the population of the country, the social and economic divide that we see in both rural and urban areas, and the hotspots that we have in majority of in main cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Indore, where there is a huge number of cases happening because of the simple fact that uh, there is a crowding of people, there is a lot of uh, clustering without much degree of social distancing. So there is ongoing many containment strategies which are working. There has to be micro planning at a, stay, at a 
city level, at a rural India level, and at a national level. So uh, a lot of work is being done. The Prime Minister's office has formed what is known as empowered groups. There are almost 10 empowered groups which are looking at different areas of how one can uh, contain the pandemic and there are uh, various strategies which are being worked at. So this is just to give you a broad overview of what we're doing. I would be happy to take any questions and suggestions if that is needed. Thank you, Dr. Galeria, for an excellent summary. Now, our next speaker, we are moving to Australia. and like to welcome uh, Dr. Ganti Cathy Rayson from Australia. She will be talking about lessons from Australia. Dr. Cathy Rayson holds dual fellowship in radiation oncology and palliative medicine and is working in Sydney, Australia. She is a clinical lead for COVID supportive care in Australia, largest cluster of COVID-19 deaths. Dr. Cathy Rayson, please do your presentation. Um, thank you. I'm just trying to share my, uh, sorry. Sorry, I'm just trying to share my, my presentation. Hang on a sec. Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome and a huge thank you for this opportunity. Here I am briefly going to discuss with you the role of supportive care and palliative care and walk you through the journey of supportive care in Sydney during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, it all started here in early to mid-March. And as we gather the experience from Europe, we quickly realized it's very crucial to start planning as there would be a huge surge in the demand for supportive care, given that we have a large population of um, elderly people here. We needed to be proactive and we needed to be comprehensive in our preparation. We identified four key areas where we needed the preparation, staff, staff, space and system. Coming to the stuff, we need to ensure that we have equipments and supplies to provide palliative care to a large number of people at a given point in time. This includes making sure we have adequate supply of end of life medications, which are used for symptom control. And we also needed to uh, come up with some innovative ideas for equipments, which used to deliver the sub subcutaneous infusions. Usually we use Nikki pumps, other syringe drivers, but because of the infection control risk, we had to um, get quite a few numbers of um, surfaces which are disposable. We also needed to have some novel ideas about our consultations. As uh, Again, because of infection control, we need to change the way we practice. So we started doing quite a bit of telehealth. Coming to the staff, we need to identify key clinicians and who are experienced in palliative care, which includes doctors and nurse expertise. As the COVID preparation is going on, we also needed to um, go ahead with our normal day-to-day -day activities. So we divided our team into COVID and non-COVID team and to avoid cross-contamination as well. And quite a bit of time has been spent on educating our frontline staff about managing the symptom control, end of life care and equipments, as we thought that health system will be overwhelmed with people who are dying. We also had anticipatory um, medications which are embedded in our, called power packs, embedded in our electronic medical um, records. Coming to the spaces, we identified very specific wards with clear focus on comfort and dignity where people can um, die peacefully surrounded by their family. We also make sure if someone wants to die at home or the place of death or the place of the choice of death, which includes aged care facilities, we make sure things are put in place. Coming to the system, healthcare pathways were created to triage and to um, identify patients who have complex symptom issues early on. COVID-19 supportive care hotline has been started uh, with a 24-hour support with a single point of call. We also understood at this point in time, it's important we need to work as a team along with um, general practitioners, emergency physicians, ICU doctors, and um, geriatricians and other palliative care physicians. Well, we are kind of very well prepared for the worst, but fortunately, we didn't get a large 
we didn't get a surge in the demand demand for hospitalization. Having said this, we had the largest, unfortunately, we had the largest cluster of death, which is almost um, 20% of the country's death in the local aged care facility. So the aged care facilities here are non-government organizations with some federal funding. On Easter Sunday, we were notified that one particular staff member um, was tested positive and all the other residents were isolated and other uh, workers were tested. And the aged care facility went on a lockdown. Within a very sh a short period of time, more than 70 people were infected, which includes staff and residents. So now we have a special task force which was set up, which includes general practitioners, geriatricians, infectious disease specialists, palliative care, public health, ministry of health, ambulance, et cetera. I guess the first thing we did was updating the advanced care planning with the clear goals and um, clear goals of care. We did discuss with general practitioners, residents and the family and coming up with treatment plans aligning, aligning with their wishes. I have to say almost 98% of the residents clearly said they wanted to stay in the nursing home, whatever happens. They were already elderly, frail, and with multiple significant comorbidities. We provided comprehensive supportive care doing daily multidisciplinary meetings with general practitioners, physiotherapists, and other um, clinicians using telehealth model. There's 24 hours on-call support for palliative care and supportive care. Coming to the symptoms and trajectories, Around 51% of the residents who were tested positive passed away, unfortunately. I guess my exp our experience is very different from what we heard from other countries. Most of them were very peaceful. They were afebrile, mildly tachypnic or dysnic. They rapidly deteriorated and passed away very peacefully. 49% of the residents recovered with significant fatigue and they were deconditioned because of isolation and depressed too. There were things put in place to help with their recovery, including supplements, regular exercise, and sunshine therapy. I just have to say the significant psychosocial distress from the families and residents were extraordinary. They felt quite isolated and abandoned. Families were, um, so we just needed to do something about that. So most of the residents in the nursing home were given a smartphone so that they can speak to their loved ones and use the video calls whenever needed. Families also joined us mostly on telehealth to say their final goodbyes and prayers, and it was quite emotional. We did have face-to-face -face consultations at times um, so that the families can come in person, just one person at a time for 15 to 20 minutes with full PPE. They did have choice of window visitations as well. I guess some of the key learning things, what we learned is early identification and importance of facilitation of advanced care planning, where you talk about patients' wishes and goals and what they want to do, especially when it comes to the COVID situation mm -hmm. and how you can align out the treatment planning according to their goals. And also it is important to facilitate the human connection, I guess, between the uh, patients and families against all odds and difficulties in this complex situation. I guess because this is what the family is going to carry through and that would help through their bereavement process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katharas. And now we will move to from Australia back to India and like to welcome Dr. Rajan Sharma uh, and who will bring perspectives from Indian Medical Association. Dr. Rajan Sharma is a renowned orthopedic surgeon from Haryana, India. Dr. Rajan is national president of Indian Medical Association. He has published many research papers and is passionate about community service projects. Please welcome Dr. Rajan Sharma. Uh, good evening, everybody. First of all, warm greetings from uh, IMA to all the members across various countries in the world. And uh, as we discuss uh, this scenario of COVID, I would just like to make a brief note about IMA. Indian Medical Association, as you all know or might be knowing, is one of the largest organization of doctors of modern medicine across the world with around 3.5 lakh members. And which is, has its branches of Pan India with 1,745 branches. 
as we i was going through the discussions uh, and was really enlightened now i am an orthopedic surgeon but now due to my involvement in ima i have got a quite a good view of uh, covid 19 but in this entire thing we also must understand the healthcare delivery system which has not been much of investment over the past few years and the healthcare delivery has been provided by all the single couple and doctor owned setups across the country wherever any help could not reach in whichever way possible we improvised we brought in new technology and still as we see a massive explosion of cases cases in uh, metro cities and uh, the healthcare facilities bursting out of its seams keeping in mind the huge size of the population of the country we have to work inclusively all across in which whether it is a uh, bigger towns or the smaller towns luckily it is restricting itself to mid metro but now it is spreading across and uh, whatever impact it comes like the uh, professor bleria was saying that the oxygen therapy and all these things have to be delivered at every district and these levels because what i see the precious time in losing the time of golden triage where you can actually intervene and manage so that has to come from below to top and to decongest these uh, setups in the metro cities and where every hospital has to work and every doctor has to work as a national and to service of the country but yes certain uh, issues which concern need to be addressed and every healthcare provider including the policy planners have to have a inclusive growth in the matter of crisis every opinion does matter association has been uh, was the first one to respond to covid with its covid guidelines we have come up with covid guidelines for living with covid also and uh, through uh, various webinars across the world we have been and in india we have been educating all our branches across the country and members on the latest in covid management and how to participate best we are already working uh, full steam in almost all part of the country and uh, doing a duty in informing about covid patients and testings to the authorities district authorities and uh, we are with the government and uh, we are all working together for the betterment of the our community but yes challenges are there a lot of challenges are there whether there is testing whether new treatments whether any future of uh, promises of vaccination and which all of us have to be in it together you sitting abroad in the best of facilities sharing your advances we in india with a huge population number because i still feel that covid is still the unknown virus and uh, we have to fight this battle together in india and across the world keeping in interest of the ailing humanity thank you thank you thank you uh, thank you so much arun bhai and thank you so much uh, rajin uh, we now move on to uh, dr nand kumar jairam to uh, introduce uh, dr rajesh chabla for his talk on ventilation rajesh could join us earlier because he was uh, busy with the uh, honorable health minister in, in in a discussion thank you again anupam i'm pleased to invite dr rajesh chawla a senior consultant respiratory and critical care medicine specialist at indraprastha apollo hospital in new delhi he is a past president of indian society of critical care and the national college of chest physicians he is also the former chancellor of the indian college of critical care medicine dr chawla please Uh, Rajesh, we can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself, Rajesh, please. 
Hello, am I audible now? Yeah, you, yes, you are. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for a nice introduction. So I am going to talk about a subject which is ventilatory management, which fortunately is not required in more than 0.5 to 1 percent of the patients. You know, if you see the pulmonary disease course and along the timeline, there are three kind of people. One is that hyperacute, where the person has a severe hypoxemia and breathlessness, which leads to immediate intubation. And then there is indolent or improving, moderate to severe hypoxemia, but only moderate work of breathing. And then there is a biphasic, where there is an initial indolent course, which is typically after five to seven days by the acute deteriorations with hyperinflammatory response, worsening respiratory failure, with bilateral infiltrates and consolidations, and they are intubated. So these are the kind of people you in, in encounter. Now, you know, before you intubate these patients, of course, majority of the people will require oxygen, which can be a nasal cannula, or it could be a venturi mask or a reservoir mask. You know, the ventilatory management of the any patients with respiratory failure involves the non-invasive ventilatory management and invasive ventilation. You know, CPAP, NIV, and HFNAC has been controversial right from the beginning because of the aerosol generations. But lately, we've come to realize that if you could avoid intubation and continue with this, the chances of survival are more. So CPAP, NIV, HFNAC, all can be used with, of course, the aerosol precautions. And one thing which I'm finding, and I think all across people are finding very useful, is awake prone positioning. I used to think the patient is very dyspneic and probably you can't prone, but you'll be surprised most of the people who are put on these non-invasive devices, you can easily prone most 70 to 80 percent of them can be easily and always target non-vigorous breathing. You know, if a person is having a very high respiratory drive on CPAP, NIV or HFNAC, he will induce a spontaneous breathing induced lung injury and the chances of outcome are very bad. So you should target non-vigorous breathing. If there is a vigorous breathing which you can't control, then probably that person should be intubated. You know, as for the indication for intubation is concerned, of course, the impending airway obstruction, sign of unsustainable worker breathing person, breathing at 14 respiratory distress, you know, he can't sustain for a long time. Refractory hypoxemia, hypercapnia or acidemia, encephalopathy or inadequate airway protection. These are the common intubation criteria. Now, this disease hypoxemia in COVID is a, has a vascular component and a alveolar component. It is not the only alveolar like you have in a typical ARDS. Gattinoni, from the data from Italy, he had classified into two phenotypes. One is a phenotype which he called the low, which had a low elastance or a high compliance. And this group of patients had a low VQ ratio, low lung weight, and low recruitability. These patients can be ventilated with 6 to 8 ml, the respiratory rate about 18 to 20. They do not respond to recruitment maneuver and PEEP, about 8 to 10 of PEEP. And you target the PEEP plateau pressure less than 28 or 30. And driving pressure, which is the difference between PEEP plat and PEEP, about less than or equal to 15. And the other type, which is the phenotype H which has a high elastance or a low compliance, which is classical ARDS, which we have been defining for last many years, and where you have to give a low tidal volume strategy. This group of patients have a low VQ ratio, low lung weight, and high recruitability. So you have to give four to six ml per kg. Respiratory rate, you can go up to 35 to overcome the hypercapnia. PEEP, these are the patients where you can give a higher PEEP and these patients, when the PF ratio is less than 150, they respond very well to proning. And again, you target the P plat before below 30 and the driving pressure equal to or below the 15 centimeter. Now, as far as the weaning of this patient is concerned, you know, one thing which I want to stress is these patients require a long ventilation. If they survive, most of these patients would require two to four weeks. 
Average days of ventilation is about 14 to 16 days. P patient in meaning, if you try to extubate these patients and reintubate, the outcome of these patient is bad. Make transitions cautiously. Avoid abrupt changes in ventilation. Spontaneous breathing trials should be done only at the very end of the weaning process, not like every day we try in a normal patient. If tracheostomy is required, surgical tracheostomy is preferred because of less aerosols. And laryngeal and tracheal edema is known in this disease. So when you extubate, you need to be careful about these. So this is in a nutshell, in a summary, I've told about the ventilatory strategies in COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rajesh. Uh, that was very helpful. And thank you so much, Dr. Nand Kumar. Uh, we've learned a lot. I'm just going to summarize in 60 seconds before we go to a Q&A. Um, in terms of clinical presentations, highly variable. Deterioration can happen rapidly. We need to have a low threshold in terms of making a diagnosis. HCQ profile access. Some data from India shows promise. Treatment, can't say just now. More data needed. Plasma, safe, promising. More data needed. Remdesivir. Some questions about safety definitely uh, has been uh, shown to show faster recovery. Um, in India, we, it's part of the solidarity trial. Liporito, more data, wait for solidarity. Anticoagulation, effective when you have raised D-dimers, keep an open mind. Plasilism map shows promise. Trials underway, there's a question on Indian trials. Indian trials start next week. Steroids, some uh, promise. Um, when used early, some more data needed. Um, Ivermectin, Nitazox, NAC, Doxycycline, Pitodimod, interesting, need data, need trials. Transfusion, no, plasmapheresis, promise, our trials are on. Uh, HBO might be interesting, let's see what the Israeli study shows later on in the week. We had uh, a nice talk on ventilation, we learned what Australia has done, we got an overview of Indi how India has uh, looked at the strategy, and of course, uh, we... Uh, uh, got to uh, un understand uh, from Randeep some of the challenges and of course Rajan talked about what IM has done. Now we move on to our Q&A uh, and we have precisely 15 minutes for the Q&A because after that we need two minutes to log into a Sadhguru session uh, that he uh, has going with us and to do the Q&A we have two distinguished colleagues from the US, Dr. Anupama who is a pediatric anesthesiologist at San Antonio. Uh, she's currently the vice president of API and will become the president in 21. And Dr. Sanku Rao, an eminent gastroenterologist, one of the founders of GAPIO, former president of GAPIO, former president of API. So over to Anupama and uh, Sanku for the next 15 minutes. And of course, please join us on the 30th uh, when we uh, have our next, uh, sorry, on the 20th when we have our next session on women's issues and we've looked at all the suggestions that have come out from Brahma and others. We will be doing specialty focused sessions and there will come a time when we'll have to revisit some of the medication when we have more data in six weeks. So over to Anupama and Sanku. Thank you. Thank you, Anupam. And uh, is Dr. Senkura on this uh, chat box somewhere? Dr. Senkura? Okay, I'll... Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can yeah. see. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, So We will be both uh, doing the Q&A session one after the other. There was a great uh, speakers all across the, so many countries. So because of the shortness of time, I think we have to make the best use of the time. So the first set of questions is for Dr. Chabra. So I'm going to give the, all the questions in a row so we won't waste any time. First one is uh, HCQ. Can it be taken as prophylaxis by the healthcare workers? If so, for how long? Keeping in mind the UK study did not show any beneficial. Number two, can you give guidance in the role of um, lopamavir and uh, ritonavir? Number three, what is the role of endomethacin and NSAIDs in a COVID situation? Number four, is there any rational cocktail? for non-complicated COVID patients. Dr. Chabra. IPS, you have like 10 seconds to answer each question. Like this is like KB. <laughs> is Dr. Chabra online? Yeah, let me just unmute myself first. Thank you. So for uh, hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis, I'm sorry, the data that we heard today, the data is not very clear. The, again, more data to come. On Kalitra, the combination, the ropinovir-rotinovir combination, 
Nimblin Journal had an article about it. I actually posted it in the chat box. If you're pretty speaking to the chat box, I posted a link to the New England Journal article. There may be some more data coming in later. I don't know, but the data very early was very disappointing. Indomethacin NSAIDs. At one time, we were avoid, we were told not to use that causes the ACE2. Nobody today spoke about the antitensin converting enzyme inhibitor problem, the receptors. But ACE2s are a problem. That's what we thought originally. The NSAIDs were not to be used. So we didn't really use NSAIDs much. So I'm sorry, I don't have any data, anything to say about endomethacin specifically. And the cocktail, I the mantra that I used was hit it early, hit it all hard, hit it with all you got. So with all I got was remdesivir, I had tocilizumab, and I had plasma. I did try anakindra, uh, that was an IL-1 blocker on a couple of patients. It wasn't very effective, lots of opportunistic infections. And also on hydroxychloroquine use, in our institutions, we did start off by using hydroxychloroquine. However, very soon, we had a lot of problems, a lot of complications, due to prolongations. We were doing daily EKGs on these patients. And remember, in those days, we were not ex exposing a lot of our members to the clinical members. If a tech has to go to do an EKG, that tech is being exposed to COVID. We wanted to minimize that. So that's my brief thoughts on this. Thank you, Dr. Chabra. The next set of questions is for Dr. Madhavi Gurusu on uh, plasma treatment, number one. Are there any guidelines for plasma therapy, number two? Do we have to do blood grouping before the plasma infusion, number three? What is the quantity to be given, Dr. Gurusu? Thank you. So the guidelines of uh, the plasma uh, infusions, I can post it on the chat box, the standard websites. Uh, it is covidplasma.org or any Mayo Clinic website has that. So that is regarding the protocol part. And uh, of course, each hospital has their own individual protocols, but I think there is some kind of uniformity because this is uh, nationally, the at least in USA, and I'm sure in India, that is the ICM. But each institution should follow whichever clinical protocol that you're following. Because remember, at least in USA, it is not yet FDA approved, and it has to be part of the clinical trial. The other part, what I got from the blood typing, yes, of course, please do. And uh, just remember, it is not as the uh, blood type, it is kind of the opposite when you look at the uh, plasma, meaning that to uh, simplify it, uh, if it is a blood group, oh, you would have said it's uh, he or she is a universal donor. Uh, whereas in the case of plasma, if it is AB, then you call it as a universal donor of the plasma. But kind of if you go, it is the opposite way um, of, but yes, you need the blood typing. Thank you very much. Uh, the next set of questions is for Dr. Nambi, infectious disease. Number one, <clears throat> if we do enoxaparam at the higher dose of 60 BID, does it cause harm in conjunction against 40 BID? Number two, what is the role of steroids? Number three, role of uh, 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 role of virulobaxin? Number four, BCG, does it give any uh, help in the immunity of these patients with COVID. Dr. Rambi. Go ahead, sir. Dr. Nambi, are you there? Uh, go ahead with the other set, uh, Dr. Sankura Garu. Okay. Um, the one question is, it is a general question. One is that um, Dr. Chabra can answer or uh, I can do that quickly. What is the smallest period when symptoms get uh, obvious and uh, the shortest period, I think it's about two days. And uh, does the P95 give absolute protection? And I think the answer will be no. It depends on a lot, lot of the how it is worn, how old, is there a shield, is there a headgear, etc. So those that we can get over with. Uh, Dr. Chakravarti, uh, one question, hypoxia in COVID patient, is it due to, is it 
from the alveolar level or the molecular level of the hemoglobin. Unmute, unmute yourself, Dr. Chakravarti. Yes. Um, is it at the molecular level or is it at the alveolar level? It's a very good yes. question. Uh, I'm not sure we know very well to answer that. Certainly, it is an ARDS process. So with uh, being an ARDS process, it will uh, be a, a lack of transmission of uh, or, or, or diffusion of oxygen. So it must be at alveolar level. Uh, from you know from basic physiology, but I don't um, know if we have any other data uh, beyond that. What we also what we know is what uh, we've heard earlier about the fact that patients come in with uh, significantly low blood oxygen levels and actually don't feel uh, as hypoxic or as this they would normally feel in other which is a very surprising. Uh, we've seen walk in with 65% fat and uh, really not being extremely breathless. And that really surprised us. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's mainly an ARDS process. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Babu Bram uh, from UK, CRP level, how does it correlate with IL-6? In other words, does CRP uh, correlate with the immune cytokine storm as a marker? Okay, um, both CR, I mean, uh, CRP is a marker of inflammation. It's non-specific, um, so it will go up. But in the patients I've seen, there is no correlation. Usually, they both go up. But I have a couple of patients who are showing signs of cytokine storm, but the CRP is not high. IL six is high. So yes, theoretically, both should go up. But you know, medicine is medicine. Uh, Thank Coronavirus you. doesn't read Harrison's, so it's not always the same. Oh, thank you very much. Now, thanks for the opportunity. Now I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Anupama Godemukula. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sinkuro. And uh, everyone take a deep breath. Uh, a lot of uh, speakers, and I think uh, we all enjoy listening to every speaker, excellent speakers. Thanks for being on the panel today. And the next question, my question, I'm a medicine so I'm going to post this question to Dr. Ratish Chawla. Uh, tips to decrease viral trauma and uh, pneumothorax on the patients who are on the vent. You know, the basic principles remains the same. You know, the these patients, when they are not paralyzed, you should not allow a very high respiratory drive. You should make sure they do not have a, they do not have a high tidal volume. You know, sometimes these patients, when they are particularly put, they are in the weaning process and you put them on a pressure support, they would create something like a liter of a, with a very low pressure support. And the... Most important thing, the basic principle which we've been following for ventilating any ARDS patient is keep the P plat below 28 or the lowest possible and the driving pressure below or equal to 50. These are the two very important things. And uh, if you follow this, the better trauma would, of course, be much less. Thank you, Dr. Shawla. And uh, my next question is to Dr. Madhvi Gursu. Uh, what is the indication of criteria for re repeat plasma therapy? What should be the gap between the first and uh, the second uh, repeat plasma therapy? Anything that you can uh, share with us? I don't think there is any kind of universal set guidelines. It depends on the clinical response or lack of, so to speak, of the patients. So in varied studies and even in our own institution, uh, I don't think anything more than a two infusions are uh, made. I think that's a fair statement. And uh, uh, a repetition of the, of the second infusion, uh, give or take in like two to three days. But after two days, after two doses, I mean to say, is there any more efficacy of giving more? I doubt it. Thank you, Madhvi. Um, I don't think we have any pediatricians, but maybe uh, one of you can answer, or maybe I'll ask Dr. Chabra. What is the status of various intervention and drugs discussed in children? 
children are having more, uh, we see more and more in children now. So Dr. Chabra, you're from New York. Maybe you can share some light on it. So uh, my, I mean, I'm an adult uh, physician. I don't really have that much experience in pediatrician. However, our institution does have a very major general hospital attached to us. And we were seeing a lot of children. The intensity of the illness was not that bad in children. However, what did surprise a lot of us was the Kawasaki-like syndrome that was seen post-COVID. Uh, so there was a slide presentation that I presentation that I saw that the patients who got these diseases they got the illness PMI, PMIS as it was called uh, post to something immune syndrome. The syndrome showed itself two to four weeks after the acute presentation of COVID. Now, in general, children were not that badly affected. The cytokine storm was not that badly seen. And one of the theories that I heard was because the level of the ACE2 receptors in those kids' lungs have not been as developed as in adults. And maybe that's why the children were not that sick. But PMIS is still, yeah, thank you for somebody, uh, for Dr. Harsha Lakshmi, uh, for putting it on the chat box. Uh, PMIS is a real disease which have to, we, have, we have to watch out for. Thank you, Dr. Chapra. And uh, the next question is to Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. Um, so a patient has uh, completely damaged lungs and uh, are they good candidates for lung transplant? Uh, you're a pulmonology critical care physician. so uh, I don't have much experience in lung transplant patient-wise. Um, uh, if if there, there is a lot of thought process on COVID um, about that, this being systemic disease, other organ systems are also affected, and there's a significant amount of clotting disorder as well. So I don't know if lung transplant is an option. There is There are some case reports where um, people have been accepted for lung transplant in major centers, but I don't know the outcomes of those. Time will tell. Uh, Anupama, we will have to wind up in about 60 seconds because we need to log into Sadhguru's uh, presentation. So maybe two quick questions. The last question is to three speakers from India, US and uh, UK. So this is uh, about the second search. So I want to hear from uh, three speakers from Australia, India and uh, so go ahead, one of you. Second search, where are we? Shall I, um, shall I take 10 seconds to answer that? Yes. So we are, we are afraid um, uh, in the medical community in the UK, we are not happy with our government. We are a little bit afraid of the fact that everybody is going back to their normal business. And we are expecting within two weeks from now um, that there will be a rise. So all hospitals are on a super preparation for this. So by the end of July, we expect that. A second surge. Dr. Jayanti, what do you all think in Australia? Unmute yourself, Dr. Jayanti. Yeah, I have. Um, sorry, we have our restrictions have been relaxed only in various stages. So we are where the government is very particular and meticulous. Having said that, with the latest protests and things, there is a fear that there could be a possible second surge sooner rather than later. Any speaker from UK? Please share okay. your thoughts. Indranil did. Uh, in India, we, have, we are seeing a surge, so there's no question of a second wave. <laughs> we don't know when the first wave is going to end. Randeep, would you like to comment on that? Because you know you have more knowledge than any of us. Randeep, would you want to comment on that? Second, I would like to say that uh, basically, currently, uh, we are still having an ongoing uh, surge of cases, and with the lockdown coming uh, becoming less uh, in two days' time from Monday onwards, there will be a huge surge of cases. My concern is that rather that the, the, currently the surge is actually predominantly in large cities maybe just about 12 cities or so, and part majority of India doesn't have that many cases. But with this movement and with migrant populations going back to rural India, we may see increasing number of cases in rural India, which is going to be a problem. 
Thank you, Anupam. Over to you. Thank you so much, Anupama and Sanku. Uh, thanks ever so much to everyone from joining from across the world. We had Mongolia, New Zealand, Australia, European countries, United States, Canada, Britain, and of course, all parts of India. Thank you very much as we draw to a close and we move over to Sadhguru's uh, um, channel for the session. Thank you very much. Until the 20th, Jai Hind. You can post the Sadhguru channel here if uh, you know. You just have to go to Facebook. Add box if you can. Yeah. Just, just go to the fa uh, Facebook of Sadhguru and, and you get it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks to all. Thank you. Huh.